As Christians, we know that we can't take credit for all the good things that happen in our lives. You know, it might be tempting to say, you know, I was able to do well on this test because I studied hard. Or I was able to give this speech because I have the ability to deliver an eloquent message or I have the ability to accomplish this or that. But we know <clears throat> that all of our abilities and talents and skills and opportunities come from Almighty God. That's the constant, clear message of Scripture. Even in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses knew that one of the temptations of the people would be to take credit for things accomplished. But it says in Deuteronomy 8, 17, Remember the Lord your God, for he is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so it's appropriate when we see an athlete give credit to God for being able to do as well as they can do on the field of play. Well, here in Joshua chapter 6, we often like to say Joshua fought, fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. But I think as we read the text, we see it's really God who fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. God graciously allows Joshua and the Israelites to participate in this narrative but in reality, it is all the work of God. Let's pick up the action. Joshua chapter 6. Now the gates of Jericho <clears throat> were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came out. So they are on high alert. And it's impressive because they have 15 foot high mud covered walls surrounding the city of Jericho. It's an area, they call it city number four, an area that's been excavated and studied for decades to find evidence of this particular battle. Of And also Jericho is considered by many archaeologists to be the oldest city in the history of the world. There's evidence of its existence going all the way back to the ninth century BC. It's, so it's got that reputation for its antiquity. So scholars are studying it not only for this event, but also for its whole existence 9,000 years before the time of Christ. But no one went in and no one came out. Verse 2, then the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. So right away in the text, where the credit goes to God, I've given it to your hands along with its king and its fighting men. And then he gives a very interesting battle plan, doesn't he? Verse 3, march around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. This seems like a very <clears throat> curious plan. Why? Would they have to do that, march around the city once a day for six days, and then later we'll see seven times on the seventh day? Well, there's actually precedence for this in, in antiquity. In the Ugaritic Karak epic, the army is instructed by the god El to stay quiet for six days without attacking. On the seventh day, the city would offer tribute for them to leave. So... There's some similarities in that ancient epic with God's military instructions to Joshua. But the marching would have added a ominous note. Can you imagine living inside the walled city of Jericho and you hear this army marching around your walls one day wondering, when are they going to attack? What are they going to do? And then the next day they do it again, and the next day do it again. So it has an element of psychological warfare. So the people, the inhabitants inside the walls of Jericho would be feeling the fear each day, wondering what is going to happen. I always think about the opening scene in the beginning of Star Wars, when you've got Rebel Alliance soldiers anxiously pointing their guns at the door, waiting for Imperial stormtroopers to come in, and Darth Vader right behind them and it's a you can feel the tension in the air in that opening scene and you can almost feel the tension in jericho what's happening what's this army going to do god was with them we heard about how he brought them out of egypt we heard about how he made them 
parted the Red Sea and got them to go through on dry ground. We heard about how we destroyed the kings of the east, Sihon, king of Og, and the king of Bashan. What's he going to do to us? And then verse 4, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns, and the Hebrew word for the ram's horns is shofar. And it was a, they used it for trumpets. They would take the horns off of the ram and they would boil the, the horns so that they got a little bit softer. And then they would kind of flatten them a little bit to give them their characteristic shape. And then they would use it for signaling battle or signaling time for a meeting. They were tuneless. You couldn't play musical notes with them. They only made the one sound. Unless you're Don Shire, you know how to get them things to sound a lot, <laughs> almost melodic. But typically they were used for clarion calls for to congregate or to prepare for war. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. It's not always typical in antiquity to bring the priests with you into battle. There are a couple times in the Bible where several times in the Bible, where Israel does that. And I think it's a reminder for the people to keep their eyes on God, because it would be very tempting to look at those 15-foot high walls, thinking, how in the world are we going to get over those? How in the world are we going to get around those? And so bringing the Ark of the Covenant and the priests would remind the people that we should be focusing on the one who's able to make the walls come tumbling down. And then in verse 5, when you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. Verse 6, so Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, and he had to call the priests because you know, this is relatively unusual um, battle plan. Now there is evidence in antiquity that on occasion there would be something of the sort where you had the priests leading the way, but not a lot. So he's going to talk with them about what the plan is. Verse 7, he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. Of course, we know that God doesn't need to be protected, but that's what Joshua is doing. He's got an armed guard in front of the ark. Verse 8, when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding, and again, you can almost feel the fear inside the walls. But Joshua had commanded the army, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Don't say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. You know, this took a lot of faith. Number one, what would stop the men of Jericho from climbing to the top of the walls and shooting and having their archers up there shooting arrows from the top of the walls? What would stop the Israelites from thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. What, when in the world are we going to attack? How are we going to accomplish anything like this? But we see the faith of the community in trusting the instructions of God, and we see the obedience of the community in trusting the instructions of God. So verse 11, he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, and the army returned to camp and spent the night. Verse 12, Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord. You know, they're really building it up, aren't they? Building up the tension. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. Verse 14, so on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to camp. They did this for six days. Now verse 15, we're on the seventh day. They got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day they circled seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. 
Joshua didn't. The Lord gave it to you. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Now, that's a very interesting expression. It's kind of foreign use of the word devotion. We think of devotion. I'm, I'm so devoted to God, I'm just going to fold my hands and pray all the time. But the Hebrew word devoted has the idea of giving something completely over to God so that it's not under human power anymore. It's under, it's under divine authority. And God wants everything in Jericho to be under divine authority, divine judgment in this case. Only the Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared. Remember Exodus chapter 12, verse, th verse 13, every house would be affected by the plague of the firstborn, but if the blood of the lamb covered the house, God passed over the judgment. So here in Joshua 6, when God saw the scarlet cord hanging out of Rahab's window, he passed over her judgment. And by implication, the same thing is true for the believer today. God passes over our judgment when we take shelter in Christ and we're covered by his blood that was shed on the cross. And Rahab is spared because she hid the spies, but also because she responded and put the scarlet cord in her window. Verse 18, but keep away from the devoted things. He will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you'd make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. Verse 20, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted at the sound of the trumpet. When the men gave a loud shout, there's a a lot of repetitions of words like shout and trumpet here. The wall collapsed so that everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword everything living in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. You say, Mark, that's so strict. Why would God be so strict? You got to go back to the Torah. We had studied this Deuteronomy chapter 18. Why would God command such a strict judgment? Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. When you enter the land, the Lord your God is giving you. Do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire. What? That's what they do in that country? They sacrifice their children as burnt offerings? Oh my goodness. And then it lists other things that they do. Practice divination, sorcery, interpret omens, engages in witchcraft or cast spells, or is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. So God is pronouncing judgment on the city-state of Jericho because of these detestable practices. First and not least is the sacrificing of children. And then verse 13, you must be blameless before the Lord your God. And so God is saying they need to be completely wiped out. There are certain times in Hebrew Bible history where the sin of a nation or a community was so heinous and so awful that the judgment of it was time for the judgment of God to fall. Jericho, we've talked about this. They're one of the oldest cities in the history of the world. They had thousands of years to get their act together. They chose not to. They kept killing children and babies and persecuting peoples. And now through the agency of Israel, God is choosing to execute his judgment. You know, when you create the universe, you have the right to run the universe as you see fit. You know, I, I never had a problem with that. You know, I, I know some people do, but... You know, I grew up in a home where I understood that my 
mom and dad made the rules, especially my mom. <laughs> and you just, you didn't always have to like the rules or agree with the rules, but you had to go along with it because they were the lords of the house. Well, on a much larger scale, God is Lord of the universe. And if anyone has the right to decisively judge sin, God's got the right to do that. Verse 22, Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, and brothers and sisters and all who belonged to her. So her faith and her words led to the salvation of her entire family. Reminds me of Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. You know, one of the terrible prices of war is the, the sanitation issues, the rampant spread of disease. I was reading about the Holocaust and how typhus and yellow fever and other terrible, deadly diseases spread through the camps. And even later on, after the Holocaust, in the displaced persons camps in Eastern Europe, tuberculosis outbreaks would break out into the camp. And it was terrible. In this particular situation, the judgment of God is on the community, but Israel also had to take sanitation actions to make sure that diseases would not rise up and spread within the community. Verse 24, they put the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. People were not supposed to keep it for themselves. We're going to find out tomorrow what happens when somebody disobeys this command of God and tries to keep some of the stuff for himself. Verse 25, but Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho and she lives among the Israelites to this day. And that expression to this day leads me to suspect that even if Joshua was primarily responsible for the writing of this narrative. It's highly possible that a later prophet like Samuel or maybe even Nathan or one of the later house or palace or temple prophets would have added the editorial inclusion of updates. Although probably not too much later than Joshua because how long could Rahab have lived, right? But she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild the city Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up his gates. And we need turn no further than to 1 Kings 16, verse 34, to find out somebody foolish enough to test that prophecy out. 1 Kings 16.34, in Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son of Iram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segev, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. You know, I read a very interesting note of what disease might it might have been that killed that person's sons. Let's see if I can find it here. It's kind of interesting. But that was the prevailing theory for a long time. Let's see if it's, if I have it here. All right, here. I got this from the InterVarsity Press Bible Background Old Testament Commentary. It used to be thought that the dedication of a house would feature human sacrifice of a child. 
That interpretation has largely been abandoned, and some researchers now see a connection between the curse and the disease schistosomiasis. This disease is caused by a blood fluke carried by snails of the type found in abundance at Jericho. It affects the urinary tract and affects fertility and child mortality. So that's the latest theory of what could have happened to Heil of Bethel's two children. Can't be proven absolutely. But one thing that is proven absolutely is it wasn't Joshua that fought the battle of Jericho. The battle belongs to the Lord. God fought the battle of Jericho. God brought judgment on that city-state because of their sinful behavior. And God has the right to judge. And people say, is that loving? Yes, it is. Because a loving God would take care of anything that would hurt or harm or be hostile to his people. Sometimes that's the most loving thing to do. I mean, how loving is it? If you let something hurtful or harmful or hostile attack your community or hurt your community or keep your community from the best that it can be. So the judgment of God is an act of love for those who do love God. It reminds them and encourages them that the God of the Bible is not only a loving God, but a righteous God who makes the world better who has plans for his people, who judges sin and rewards righteousness. And since we have such a holy, loving, righteous God who fights our battles, we need to trust and obey him as Joshua and the Israelites did. And give your life to God and remember that Christ himself took all the judgment of God upon himself when he died on the cross for your sins and rose again. And it says in the Bible, in John 5, 24, that anyone who believes in God and Christ will not come into judgment. He's crossed over from death to life. So cross over with me to life by putting your faith in God and Christ. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We'll be back tomorrow for Joshua chapter 7. Have a good day.